Okay. Good morning, everyone. My brother Jack here. I'll get things set up. Okay. We'll take a look at it that way. See how that's looking. That looks pretty good. Focus on my word here. The camera focusing on it. Okay. Hmm. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. As you can see, I'm trying to focus on my camera. I want to focus on me here on the word. Back up a little bit. See how it goes there. Okay. Well, that's the name of my little study this morning. <laughs> Focus on the word. And what did I do? problems here with my camera get to the focus uh, I'll cut it over here so you can kind of see what I'm dealing with smudge on my camera here or what? Live, that's right. Okay. That sucker. Oh. In there. No good. Okay. Turn that off. This must be a thing called a focuser. All right, put that one there. Let's see if that one is better. Well, you know when you start something, a road, like anything else, you got to get educated. And so, voila! I just learned how to uh, focus this particular camera. I want to wish everybody a praise the Lord this morning as we get ready to go down to see the Gospel of John. Hey, it's about 6.30 this morning. And
Lord, I want to thank everyone for here, coming, stopping by this morning as you're getting ready to go to work. Uh, we got one more pretty day here, Don, Brother Don, if you're listening. Uh, congratulations on your uh, search to get your uh, music uh, established in Nashville. I'm very happy for you. But, uh, God does want to give you the desire of your heart. So those people coming up and helping you along the way with certain uh, contributions, blessings, uh, could be a sign that you're in the right spot for your music. The Bible says he'll withhold nothing uh, to anyone who walks upright before him. So I'll be praying for you on that matter, Don. So today is election day. I mean, it was yesterday. So I hope you went out to vote. And as you see, the destiny of the political persuasion in our country is going to probably end up with the Herschel Walker and Warnock guy down in Georgia to get that control of the Senate. You know, it always reminds me of a scripture Jesus says, a house divided itself cannot stand. If this be the truth, why in the world is America still rolling? because you can't get more divided than what you've seen if you're paying attention to the election. So it's 50-50, 50-50, and maybe the Republicans got a little bit on the House, but essentially our Congress is divided right to the hilt. So how can this be and we still be rolling like we are? Well, the Bible says Jesus made all things and in him all things consist. So really, his grace is the glue that's holding our country together. Him, he's why it's still rolling. And, and for example, we've got trillions of dollars in debt and there's no way we can pay that. You can't even measure, I don't even wanna go into how big trillion is. You've seen graphs on it, it's immeasurable, but yet, we're still rolling. It's because of the good Lord Jesus. Why? He has still has purpose for this country, not only because we are the light, so to speak, like he's working with Israel later, we're the best light that he's working with in, in this country to go around the world, the light of the gospel is going forth. And so it pleases the Lord to uh, hold our country together while he's working to get his harvest in before he appears for his people. That's my take on it. So regardless, because the Bible says things are going to get darker and things get brighter. He's looking, you're either going to be a tear or you're going to be wheat. If you're wheat, he's gathering the wheat into his barn, the rapture. But if you're going to be a tear, you're going to be left behind and you're going to be in big, deep doo-doo if, uh, if the church comes for, Jesus comes for his church and you want to know what happened to us, well, the first thing you're going to figure out is they were right. <laughs> and then the odds of you being pressured and trying to, the world and the devil will try to make you uh, think it was a flying saucer invasion or something, some ridiculous thing, just to keep you uh, off. So you'll be a little puzzled for a while, but eventually uh, you'll come around to the devil and the mark and all that stuff. But in any event, today is a new day. His mercies are new today forever. His graces, I mean, his grace is new every day. So let's get started. <sighs> It says, Jesus goes to Judea, the gospel chapter, I mean Mark chapter 3. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and he tarried with them and baptized. Now, it clarifies later that uh, 
Jesus didn't baptize anyone, but it doesn't say this. So the next little thing is uh, John the Baptist of Anion. And John also was baptizing Anion near Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized for John was not yet cast into the prison. This was a beautiful time. Okay, so then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and Jews about purifying. And I would like to suggest that this might be the first evidence from John's recollection here about Jesus and John that this thing, a question between some of John's bunch about purifying, and they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness. Behold, the same baptizes all men come to him. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. That includes all the gifts you have, not your skills they are developed, but your gifts and your callings with God. Uh, and you got them uh, when you uh, got one. He never takes them away. But 28, he said, Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. <clears throat> 29. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. For he must decrease, but I must he, he must increase, but I must decrease. I want to come back over here to this part here where it said uh, verse 2. And they're basically, wait, let me see. Uh, there, that word, there was a question between John's disciples. And what was going on here is, what's going on here, this is the first time you're going to see uh, the spirit of division coming in among God's people in terms of Jesus' earthly ministry. Uh, there's another verse uh, later on in the Lord's Gospel, and... Uh, they are, just, he sent the disciples out and they are going out and they come back one time and uh, they said uh, there was somebody we met out there that was doing things uh, that you said to do but he wasn't of our, our little 12 here and uh, should we call, uh, call fire down upon him? Jesus said no. He says you don't want no don't know what manner type of spirit that you are. She says, but he, he who does anything in my name, you don't have to worry about it. Okay. So this brings me to another point. I'm not going to look it up, but one of God's, John's, little, little John's verses, uh, he says, he that has the son has the father, and he who acknowledges the father has the son also. Why this verse is, these verses are so important because it spreads over all denominations of the Lord's body. There are many different denominations and their central focus point is number one, that Jesus was crucified for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again. This is the core of the Christian value. And I don't care if you're Methodist, Catholic, Seventh-day Adventist, Jesus only, charismatic, uh, prosperity, you know, the whole, the whole schmo, okay. There's one thing that binds us all together. Now, there's some people who don't really believe in the Trinity, and there's some that do. But that verse in John says, he that has a son has a father, and so likewise, because so that verse, you'll find it as you're reading through the little Johns, uh, that it, it binds us all together. In other words, it, those verses give us scriptures that crosses over denominational boundaries among God's people and makes us one inside uh, spiritually. Now, people like the Mormons, 
Uh, they're out of bounds. Jehovah Witnesses are out of bounds because they've got a problem with the deity of the Lord and uh, other problems. But the essential part of all the denominations uh, are centered around and can be utilized through those verses I spoke to you about. So this, but this particular verse I was talking about was when Satan, since he, he was trying to start division about, I believe like you do, but you're doing it different. And he was trying to start a fight. So I think that's the first time I ever saw denominational problems. Anyway, let's go back. Now, when Jesus starts talking about the bride and the bridegroom, it brings up a controversial, uh, controversy, a controversy about the bride and who the bride and the bridegroom is. Well, there is a lot of right here. Let me go to this camera. There's a lot of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Opinions uh, about who the bride is, what's going on. And I, my opinion is, from what I have learned, I believe it's not uh, the uh, body of Christ. It's New Jerusalem. Uh, but the Bible says at the end of the times, when there'll be a time after the millennial reign, uh, if you go to Revelation, and it, it talks about New Jerusalem coming down, uh, joining Jesus, uh, at the end of the uh, millennial reign, where we'll be all in all, and the Father will abide with us there. And if you look at those verses in the last, I think it's the last chapter or two of Revelation, it will tell you that as a bride adorned uh, abruptly comes down. So, but what is cool about it, when we go to be with the Lord after the rapture, our residence will be in heaven with Jesus or wherever he is. However, uh, when he comes down here the, uh, at the end of the millennial reign, uh, we'll be joined together after the Lord renovates the earth and everything. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. But that Jerusalem, I'm saying that Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, carries more weight from what I, what I, I read and understood about who the bride of Christ is, rather than I used to always think it was the, the body of Christ, but Jesus, you can't marry your body, okay? And there are many scriptural references in the Old Testament and uh, uh, Revelation that kind of uh, comes in agreement that New Jerusalem really is the uh, bride of Christ. Okay, that's just my opinion. Okay, let's roll. I love this verse here. He must increase, but I must decrease. Well, how does that how does that happen? Well, the Bible talks about uh, when you get saved. It says, "Be not conformed to the image of this world, but submit yourself in your body to the Lord, and let your not mind be renewed day by day." It says, "Though the outward man perish, the inward man." is renewed day by day. Now in 31, John says, He that comes from above is above all, speaking of Jesus. He that is of earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies that no man receives his testimony he hath received his testimony as set to his seal that God is true. I should uh, verify it to John. For whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God gives not the spirit by measure to him. This is a beautiful verse. You want to know. Okay, I'll just talk what that's up. Well, this prompts where you'll want to know how can Jesus be the Son of Man and Son of God at the same time? Well, he's Son of God because his Father is God. Our Father is, is God. And he did not have an earthly father. He had an, 
he had an earthly father, uh, or stepfather, I guess you could say, Joseph. But he was the lineage in the right lineage of the Davidic lineage. However, uh, so when Jesus grew up, he didn't have the sin nature that we all have. But yet, he, the Bible says he was tempted like all, all of us, but yet without sin. Isn't this cool? That's really cool. But so at the time, the Holy Spirit could not be, didn't, nobody was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit came on people in the old days. The judges, uh, David, Samson. And when the Spirit came upon them, uh, they did extraordinary things. But during Jesus' earthly ministry here, though, the Holy Spirit has not yet been given uh, uh, to uh, other people rather than himself. So when Jesus got baptized in the water and that dove came down and rested on his shoulder... Uh, the Holy Spirit and him became partners, so to speak, in his earthly ministry. So when Jesus, uh, let me take for example, when uh, Jesus went, was in the temptation uh, and the devil tried to tempt him by telling him to throw himself off the temple corner there, and it's just because the angels uh, have been charged to uh, save you, uh, keep you from dying. And Jesus told him, and says, you should not tempt the Lord thy God. Him only shall you serve. Well, that was a tempt. They was trying to provoke Jesus into using his deity. Okay. But he knew his limits while he's down here with the Son of Man, and that would be wrong. That was Satan's problem. Uh, he uh, got the big head and tried to take over. So when Jesus started his earthly ministry, the Holy Spirit in him, when he was helped him as he went, and because part of his ministry would to be show to the Jews signs and wonders, so every time Jesus and the Holy Spirit started out in their daily journey, they worked together. Now us, since we have those of you who have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you have access to the same power that. Uh, Jesus experienced, but before that, it was just Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and this is why it says uh, his spirit was not given by measure to him. It was really uh, all that he needed to get the job done. Okay, 35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. How about that? Dad loves Jesus so much. He says, now before you go down there, they're talking in heaven. He says, when, I, when you go down there and uh, it's going to take you in a minute to realize who you are because after you're born, you don't have the, the mind to think about that. But somewhere in your childhood, uh, I'm going to come to you and uh, we're going to have a little talk and uh, you're going to realize you're not like other people in the, in the sense that you're my only begotten son. Probably some kind of conversation went on like that. And so, uh, and in that conversation, before he got born, they probably uh, uh, talked about that. And so, when he comes with a revelation, maybe perhaps when he was in the temple, uh, was a young boy, uh, talking about things of the, uh, of the Lord and scriptures, and he was sitting there listening and asking questions. And when uh, they found out where he was at after they, he left him there, his mother kind of rebuked him and said, where you been? Don't you know we've been looking for you? He said, uh, How, why are you looking for me? Don't you know I should be about my father's business? So there's some evidence there at that young age that Jesus knew that the father had given all things into his hands. Because what is the father's business? Well, the father's business is us. <laughs> the Father's business is to make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Father's business is to have Israel be the chief nation that he would use to represent him and who he is to all the pagan nations of the world. And, and that one day, all in all will be gathered things in heaven things in the earth. The Bible talks about Colossians 
that everything will be gathered to him. Okay, we're going into verse chapter 4 here. When Jesus, therefore, the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Well, that's just what I was talking about, that division. And there's what I said too, verse 2. Though Jesus himself baptized not, Jesus did not baptize, but his disciples did. So you got Jesus' disciples and you have John's disciples. And pretty soon they have a little conversation. He left to Judea and departed again into Galilee, for he needed to go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city, Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Wow, I bet you that's a beautiful place. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary with his journey, oh, see, Jesus, there's the natural... Joseph, Jesus, son of man, getting wearied in his journey like you and me. So he sat on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Then there comes a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, give me to drink. I'd like to take a second and explain a little bit about Samaria. Samaria is uh, when G uh, the Rome took over uh, Israel and was ru ruling running them back in those days. Uh, they, is Israel was under Rome's thumb, and Herod, of course, uh, was appointed by Rome to watch over Israel and keep them in line. Well, in the area of Samaria, I don't know whether it was how it came to be, but somehow the Samaritans were kind of mixed. Uh, the Israel nation at that time, there were strict, or no, I don't like the word strict, but very devout Jews. And they kind of like was one particular, the real deal Jews. Okay, there's rules you can get. But the Samaritans were kind of, I guess we would call them carnal Christians. They're, you know, they're in and out all the time. And But uh, you ask them, well, uh, what their deal is, you know. Oh, I believe in Messiah. Okay, so they're kind of like that. So because of that in and, in and out all the time and mixing and stuff like that, uh, they became a uh, uh, not cool with the regular Jews back in those days. All right. Then comes a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me to drink. Well, today, uh, if a girl, you was in the park, and a girl came by with her water bottle, and you said, give me to drink, we would think that would, to our, in our culture today, we would think that would be a little uh, intrusive, a little bold. But back then, and, because he's asking a female here, give me to a drink. But she was on her way to get the water anyway. It's because it's, verse 8 says, His disciples were gone away to the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria to him, How is it thou, being a Jew, ask me a drink of me, which is a woman of Samaria, where the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans? Well, see, that's just what I was talking about. You see that? So Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked me and I would have given you the living water. The woman said to him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. The well is deep. How are you going to give me that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank? thereof himself and his children and his cattle. And Jesus said, Whoever drinks of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life.
Well, we're going to talk about this a minute. I want to try to explain what I've learned about this. The living water is comes when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Or when you receive Jesus and you get filled with the Spirit. That living water comes in the uh, form, I guess you could say, when you become an adopted child, you come into Christ's family legitimately and your sins are forgiven, you receive the Holy Spirit at that time. But there is another thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it comes upon you, its power, and, and, and it, gives, it empowers you to do to be a witness, the Bible says. And however how that can be in your life, that's what it does. Well, this living water is inside you. And how you extract that living water is your prayer language, praying in the Holy Spirit, praying with other tongues, unknown tongues. Because originally, when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, most people get the an unction from the Holy Spirit, and they'll start speaking this unknown language. Well, it's an unknown, unknown, unknown language to us, but not to God. But God is the initiator of that language. And as you learn about, uh, when you get your heavenly language and you learn to utilize it, this is what this scripture is talking about. You learn to praying in your tongues or heavenly language, or whatever you want to call it. When you do that, you begin to charge your battery, Jude 20 says, by praying in the Holy Spirit, building up your most holy faith. This battery gets charged inside of you. And then in the name of Jesus, when you're praying, you can release it. Okay? And this living water comes up out of you and begins to flow in every nook and cranny to help the saints. Because the Bible says sometimes we don't know what to pray for. But the Holy Spirit makes intercession according to the will of God through our infirmities. Now that goes into a different little teaching, but the living water is something that's deposited into you. But you must learn through praying in the Spirit how to release that. So I suggest if you're curious about it, go to uh, on the internet and dial in some good teachings on it and they will kind of further instruct you about it, okay? All right. All right. We'll get back to the woman. This woman says to him, Sir, give me the water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, Thou as well said, I have no husband. For you've had five husbands, and one now that you're living with is your boyfriend. Turn the page. My husband said to her, Truly, the woman said to her, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worship in this mount, and you say that in Jesus, Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So that was one of the different uh, problems Samaritans had, uh, the location of the proper place to worship. Now, Jesus says to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming. Hallelujah. When you will neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You know, the Jews have not got that yet. That's because they rejected him. But you have if you're a born-again believer. It says, you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Now at this time, no one knew about the body of Christ in the church. And Jesus was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And this is why he's just saying, but salvation will always be for the Jews, even when Jesus starts dealing with them in the last days. He says, but the hour comes and now is 
This is the good news when Messiah is there, when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. Well, Dad, that's what Dad likes. He's looking for worshipers, so my wife is a big worshiper. I could do better, but she loves to worship. And he said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, I wanted to make a point here about, uh, let's see. Our fathers worship in this mountain, and uh, Jesus says, this is the place the men ought to worship. And so... What I'm saying is, there's a lot of people uh, Jesus is talking about. They're worshiping God, but they're not worshiping our God. There's only one way you can worship our God, and it matters, is you have to be his child. He, he only has one body. He doesn't have other children. Much, he's trying to get more children into his fold. With the fold, uh, Jesus said, there are others in the fold that's going to come to me beside the Jews. That would be us. So he's, every time, every brother or sister that, that receives Christ's forgiveness becomes one of his children. And then this puts you in position to learn how to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Uh, the truth would be Jesus. So you have to be in Jesus to be legitimately and and the Spirit had the Holy Spirit to worship Him. This is what uh, the it's two essential mandatory things that children of the Most High must have. Okay. All right, All right. we're getting back. So the woman says to him in verse 25, I know that Messiah has come which is called Christ, when he has come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I that speak to thee am he. Wow. I that speak to you am he. Well, how does the Lord speak to us now? It's been a long time ago. He speaks to us through this, this word right here. That's called the Logos word. And that he speaks to us by his spirit. But you have to train your ear, after being in the family for a while, to learn to listen to his ear, uh, the Spirit, because there are many voices that will try to fake you out. Uh, they'll talk to you and try to pass themselves off as the Holy Spirit. But through experience, as you grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll learn how to not act upon them, and they're always going to be talking to you in some kind of way to try to make you think, it's God talking to you. But when God really says something to you, uh, most of the time, you'll know it's him. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, What seekest thou? What are you talking with her about? Well, they wanted to know everything, didn't they? The woman then left her water part and went into the city and said to the men, Come see a man which told me all things Ever I did, is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. Uh, this story, many people were talking about that story. There's, so there's a lot of uh, good meat in that story. But I don't have the time to, to go into all those different aspects. Well, how I, what's my time running? I'm running about 40 minutes, so let me see how much. I'll do a little bit more. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Then the disciples said to one another, Has any man brought him something to eat? Jesus was always throwing curveballs to his disciples because he was so heavy. So uh, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and finish his work. Well, I guess we could apply that to ourselves. Because this should be our will to do his will. I guess his will is letting him 
work his will through us and to finish his work. And so we all have a work to finish. Sometimes we in our life will, uh, you know, whenever the Lord comes on board with you, then you'll find out you have a life uh, that God wants you to have and to be a life that you had formerly been living. And somewhere along the Lord, you start making the transition. So he says to them in verse 35, don't say there are four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already harvest. And he that reaps wages and gathers fruits unto life eternal, and both he that soweth and he reapeth may rejoice together. I don't know if you ever heard that song, Bringing in the Sheaves, We Shall Come Rejoicing, Bringing in the Sheaves. Herein is that saying true, one sows and another man reapeth. He says, I sent you to reap where you bestow no labor. Other men labor and you are entered into their labors. Well, Paul's gospel, the gospel of grace, our gospel, he says it like this, some sow seed, some water, but God gives the increase. I was out yesterday and I did a couple of water and I watered a woman who was coming out of the Kroger parking lot. She needed a, a she needed a, a cart. And so I gave her, she said, I need my cart. She says, she was holding on to the front car fender. She says, so I can balance myself. So the Lord, I kind of, well, I didn't hear from the Lord. I just knew in my heart that I wanted to use that as an opportunity to uh, pray for her. So I walked over, gave the cart, and I asked her if I could pray for her. She said, okay. So I put my hand in hers and on her shoulder, and I prayed for her. And I used it as an opportunity. Uh, usually when I pray for people out in the street, I usually say, because I want to make the connection that God is where and wants to help them. So I will usually say something like, it was no accident that I was here and you were here. Because the Lord says, uh, his lamp is unto my feet and a light unto my path. The past of the justice is a shining light. He ordains our steps, all those verses. Okay. And I tell them it was no accident that God was aware that your old lady and your, I didn't say that, but uh, that you're recovering from a stroke, you know, and then he, and so I prayed for her and I went into the prayer a little bit. The other, t other time uh, I was coming, I went to another Kroger because I was looking for my gravy. I like gravy. And so as I was coming out of that parking lot, there was a homeless guy standing there. And I don't have any cash, I didn't have any cash. But I did have bought two donuts that uh, 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 I purchased, okay. And so while I'm waiting at the light, he's standing there at the light, I'm waiting for the light to change to get out on Washington Street. I, uh, I said, well, I says, would you like a couple of donuts? And he, he had an impediment, and yang, 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 something like that. So I stopped it. The people behind me were trying to wait to, uh, waiting on me to take care of my business with the homeless guy. I didn't care if they could wait. <laughs> so I got out of the car, uh, rummaged through the back of my groceries, and I found my two donuts, which I really shouldn't have got for me. Okay. <laughs> I give it to him. But when I gave it to him, and I'm talking about watering now, okay. I watered the one gal with prayer through a meeting opportunity, and I'm watering this guy. He says, I said, he says, thank you. I says, no, don't thank me. Thank the Lord. Now, I have a cap that I wear, usually everywhere I go, and it says Jesus saves on it. And I could tell the way he was talking. He didn't have all these cards. But anyway, I said, no, and I kept pointing to my cap. I said, no, thank him. Thank Jesus. Okay, I'm trying to make the connection. And so he got it. And he said, thank you, Jesus, something like that. Okay. So I watered on that cat. It was a two donut water, but it was good watering. What was the cool thing about that is he spoke the name of Jesus out of his mouth. He spoke the name of Jesus out. He was a dry well like this woman here. Okay, dry well. And when Jesus, you know, you're the temple. Now, they, their temple was external, but you and I are the temple of God. 
and the door of the temple is your lips. So when you speak the name of Jesus, it releases beautiful things. It's love. It's life. Okay, And he probably had never orally spoke the name of Jesus in a long time. But when he spoke that, whatever was oppressing him, I began, he began, I believe it was the first point of starting getting him restored back to where the Lord would like him to be and where he feels like he would want to be. So I just want to bring that up, not to draw attention, but because I was talking about watering and the living well. Okay, so that's all I'm going to have for you today. So I'd like to thank everybody for stopping by. You know, when I'm reading the Gospels and, and trying to give commentary on it, uh, some of you uh, are just coming into the Lord. Some of you, you don't know the Lord. And I'm touching on a lot of things that perhaps you knew a million times or probably could say it better. But there's some of, but there's some of you who haven't and wanted to hear it. Then I'm glad that you did. And even I'm finding out if you don't catch this live feed, you can always go to my, uh, I got a little thing called Are You Ready Ministries and it's on YouTube. And you can dial it in there. But I suggest and I strongly want you to uh, be enriched today. I want you to be blessed. I want you to uh, stop looking at your circumstances so much, okay? They're going to catch up with you. But I want you to get into that tongue-talking stuff because that's where the power is. That's where the peace is. Uh, I'm not saying you can't have peace now, but I'm saying you can have more peace. It's kind of like a motor, getting your motor running, get out on the highway looking for adventure, born to be wild. <laughs> but uh, uh, you charge yourself, your battery up, and then you release it. Now I'm going to release uh, my power, of the Holy Spirit in me, to you, this living water. So in the name of Jesus, that the people who are dialing in or listening to this eye, I want you to say in the name of Jesus, I receive this living water that Jesus has for me by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want, Jesus said, John said, I baptize with water, it's but Jesus comes and baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the baptizer. So I'm going to pray for you to be that Jesus would baptize you in the Holy Spirit. So in the name, Father, I just bring your children before you. I thank you that you are the baptizer. And as you baptize them in the Holy Spirit, I pray this living water that lives in us will release and they will begin to speak with other tongues. So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, right now, let the living water flow. Jesus' name, flow. Flow now. Flow in Jesus' name. Flow, river, flow. Flow, river, flow in Jesus' name. Flow now. Shapaka. Flow shadahanaka. Flow now. Jesus name. Shadahashadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahadahad
by praying in the Holy Spirit, that charges your battery. And sometimes when you're praying for people in your own private prayer time, you don't know how to, you can call their name, but after you go to a half a dozen names to pray for the country, you're pretty well done, right? Well, not with the Holy Spirit. When you learn how to pray in the Spirit, He will bring people and situations up to you that you can cooperate with Him and be a more effective for your people that you're praying for because the Holy Spirit, Paracletus, means He comes alongside of you. So when you open your mouth, He shows up and begins to merge, and you take hold together, the Bible says in Greek, okay? You take hold together, and you begin to carry that message, and it, and it flows out through this living water, and it goes up to God, and he knows expect, expect, exactly where that uh, those prayers should be directed. I'll tell you one little thing before I, left, before I go. One time I was praying in the Holy Spirit, and I don't know what you want to call it, but I saw an airplane. And in this airplane, well, like you saw in transport planes, military transport planes, there was this big giant transport plane. And went in the back of the plane, along a row on each side were all these angels. Instead of parachutes, they had on all the needs uh, for people who had been praying, whether it's for healing, a leg, an arm, a house, uh, their friend, but symbolically they had all these things all these angels as this plane is flying over they're getting the signal light to bail out and parachute down and bring that answer to your prayer or to those you're praying for so then it switched to the cockpit where the pilot was and uh, the radio man and the co-pilot says to the pilot he says look over there look over there and he looked out the window and he saw all this going on he said we would love I said there's where they really need the prayer right there and the co-pilot says to the other co-pilot he says yeah but you know we don't have orders to go there we don't have any prayer requests for them <laughs> about that time a crackle came over the radio from the dispatcher he says wait we have a code coming in. And he tore that off the, off the typewriter there. And he took it over there to the, uh, the co-pilot. He says, oh, now we have a divine order through the prayer language of the saints that gives us the authority to dispatch angels to that region. That's why it says sometimes we don't know who or what to pray for, but the Holy Spirit does. And through your prayer language and your speaking in tongues, you give permission for God because Jesus makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You authorize those angels to be dispatched where they need to be, not where you think they should be. And I thought that was the most beautiful thing I ever seen, and it really helped me. Well, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in good health, children, even as your soul prospers. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.